Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2015 Royal Tyrrell Museum Speaker Series. Today, the Royal Tyrrell Museum and its cooperating society are very pleased to, to welcome our very own Dr. Jim Gardner. Jim is a curator of paleoherpetology here at the Royal Tyrrell Museum. Uh, Jim was kind enough to write his introduction, so you'll see that the style is slightly different from what I usually say during the introduction. So. Like many Albertans, J Jim is originally from Saskatchewan. <laughs> but unlike most people from Saskatchewan, he is not a Rough Riders fan. Jim was born in Moose Jaw, where he spent the first few years of his life in a mobile home, which may explain his well-known affection for the TV show Trailer Park Boys, <laughs> before his parents purchased a grain farm just south of Regina, in the part of Saskatchewan that is tabletop flat. Jim started his undergraduate degree at the University of Regina before transferring to the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon, where he completed his bachelor's degree in paleobiology. He subsequently moved to Alberta to pursue his master's in biological science at the University of Calgary, where his thesis was on the systematics of fossil soft-shell turtles from the late Cretaceous of Alberta. Jim then pursued a leisurely PhD at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, where his dissertation was on the systematics of fossil amphibians from the late Cretaceous of Western North America. Jim began working at the Royal Tyrrell Museum in, of Paleontology on April Fool's Day in 2000 as the collections manager. Then in 2007, he transferred into the museum's research program as the curator of paleoherpetology. Although Jim maintains a soft spot for soft-shell turtles, most of his research is now devoted to the evolutionary history of amphibians, such as salamanders and frogs, particularly those with a fossil record in Alberta and elsewhere in North America. Over the past few years, Jim has co-edited several collections of scientific papers. Currently, he and fellow curators Don Henderson and myself are assembling a collection of scientific papers commemorating the Royal Tyrrell Museum's 30th anniversary which will be published later this year as a special volume of the scientific journal, Canadian Journal of Earth Sciences. As part of that project, Jim has been delving into the history of research conducted at the museum, a topic that he will be discussing in his talk today. So without further delay, I present you Dr. Jim Gardner. Alrighty. So, you can plainly read the title of my talk, so I'm not going to repeat it for you. <laughs> this year marks the 30th anniversary of the official opening of the Tyrrell Museum. And, uh, of course, it has its origins even earlier. Uh, there's a clip here, a report in uh, July of 78 government committing to build some sort of paleontology museum in Drumheller, uh, formal announcement in about April 1980. And then in uh, September 25th, officially opened, and uh, this is purportedly a shot of opening day. It could actually be any August long weekend <laughs> since then, I think. And in the 30 years since the museum has been open, it's become uh, a major, <coughs> major tourist attraction in Alberta. I've heard, although I don't know if it's true, that it's one of the top three along with uh, Banff and the West Edmonton Mall. So we're right up there with mountains and shopping. It's also become a major, uh, it's been a major economic belt benefit, obviously, to the, uh, the town, the local community with tourists coming through, hopefully spending money. Uh, many of us who work at the museum moved to Drumheller, and so we, we live here, pay taxes, conduct business here, and so forth. And the museum is well known, of course, for its, uh, for its dinosaur exhibits. This is a slightly older uh, version of our dinosaur hall. And occasionally, we hear little bits and pieces about research that's going on at the museum or, or discoveries. Um, a good a recent example is this uh, discovery and collection uh, last fall of a uh, duck-billed dinosaur block. Now, in the media, if you're going to get media exposure, it really helps if it's uh, got a good story of discovery. 
fellow fishing saw this in the river, if you can get some helicopter action going on. And uh, I think it really helps too if it actually looks like something. And of course you need a charismatic dinosaur researcher to, uh, to talk about it. We also get some press for what I call splashy scientific publications, like this paper a few years ago on, a, uh, on several ornithomimid dinosaur specimens with the first evidence of feathers in that group. So that was a, was a, a legitimately newsworthy uh, story. But most of what happens here in the research program really doesn't make, make the news. Uh, there's lots of publications that are produced by scientists here, uh, often working in collaboration with others. There's, uh, for example, this really gripping recent publication by Dennis on, uh, it's a monograph on triprojectite pollen from Western North America. Um, edited collections uh, in books or in journals, and then literally hundreds of uh, scientific research papers. So although some of that, or a lot of that, isn't flashy in the sense that it makes the news, it's, uh, it is all interesting and it contributes to our understanding of Earth history. And the Tyrrell Museum has been a major player in Alberta for the past uh, three decades in, uh, in that sort of research, those sorts of endeavors. And so to paraphrase Francois from last year and his promote, or not last year, last week, uh, and his promotion, we're going to take a little walk down memory lane. And so like Marion's little friend here, we're going to totter down some winding back alleys, peering into some dark corners, and uh, seeing what has happened. Now I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to be rooting through the trash to tell any really great stories. That would have to be another talk. And for those of you who are wondering about the the title of my, uh, my talk, Money for Nothing, it has nothing to do with the lyrics, at least in my personal experience here. The, uh, the actual reason is that that happened to be the number one song on the Billboard charts the week that the museum opened. Plus, it's just a great song. So a little bit of backstory, as Francois mentioned. We're uh, putting together a uh, commemorative a uh, special issue of uh, invited scientific papers. Um, this, is, this is how uh, scientists celebrate things. We all go back to our offices and we write papers and then we put them together and publish them to great fanfare. <laughs> so the theme of this is the geology and paleontology of Alberta. We have a number of authors, uh, current and past Tyrrell researchers and a number of other colleagues, because we do a lot of collaborative work with uh, other researchers in the province and elsewhere. Um, 13 papers, a, a range of ages from the Triassic to the Paleocene, variety of different uh, taxa are covered, and there's even three new fossil uh, taxa that are named in this, uh, in this new paper. And we're quite pleased in addition to the research papers, we, uh, we also, have an original painting that Donna Sloan kindly painted for the cover, uh, depicting a scene in the Dorothy East Cooley area about 70-ish million years ago of a feathered ornithomimid, and there was that recent feathered ornithomimid found in that area, pottering along the, uh, the seashore. This is the Western Interior Seaway here after a storm. And as a nice touch, you'll see scattered on the beach there's a number of oyster shells. Oysters produce pearls. Pearl is the traditional present on a 30th anniversary. Now, as part of the, uh, the role of putting together one of these edited volumes, um, the editors, mostly me, are also on the hook for writing an introduction. And that seemed like a really good opportunity to review a little bit of the history of the museum and uh, the accomplishments and of the research program. So I thought, well, that, that should be not too bad. I sort of have a handle on what's going on. And then I quickly realized that institutions are notoriously bad at documenting their own history. 
uh, which is kind of a problem for me as a, one of the younger kids because uh, I wasn't here at the very beginning. My association with the museum does go back a little earlier than 2000. I um, was here often during the course of my graduate work back into 1989. And I did actually attend a couple of the, uh, the early conferences here at the museum in 87 and 88, I believe. So the next step was to, well, let's look at the literature. Is there anything there? There's a couple of um, early publications that talk about the, the plans for the museum and after it's opened, how, how people thought it was going to turn out. Those are kind of amusing to read. Um, there was a couple of articles published in the mid-90s by uh, uh, Bruce Naylor and, uh, yeah, I totally forgot his name. Anyway, there was a couple of articles published, uh, very short ones. They're more, more promotion pieces, actually, um, sort of talking about some new exhibits and some, some, some recent work. So a little bit of information there, not a whole lot. And then there's a couple of uh, books that contains some, uh, some useful information, especially David Spaulding's one on uh, the, uh, the origins and uh, the startup of the museum. And there's a bit, bit in Wayne Grady's on the Dinosaur Project, the, uh, the first big international project the museum was involved in. But the information pretty well peters out by the late 1990s. And one of the fun things about looking at these older ones is you get to see things like the cover article on internet. <laughs> yeah, I wonder how that worked out. So the next step is to actually consult some of uh, what I call the old timers, the, uh, the original curators who are still around. Uh, Phil Curry, he's not here anymore, of course. Um, but Phil was the founding curator now at the University of Alberta, and Phil's been really generous with uh, sharing his recollections and some uh, some photographs, and the uh, three of my colleagues, uh, Don Brinkman, Dennis Brayman, and Dave Ebert. And I gotta say, they were pretty good sports about posing for this picture. They knew exactly what I was going for. The three oldest curators with the oldest fossil in our collection. <laughs> this is uh, fossil algal mounds, stromatolites, about uh, 1.3 billion years old from uh, Waterton. So thanks guys, you were good sports. And uh, or they were also really generous in, in uh, sharing information and uh, especially Dave providing me with dozens of uh, PowerPoint slides that I could pillage for my talk today. Uh, they're a great source of information and I always really enjoy listening to what they have to say. <laughs> <laughs> there are many photos in the Gardner family album with me looking exactly like this. <laughs> it's uh, actually, yeah, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> so a bit of historical context, I'd like to point out that paleontology did exist in Alberta before the, the Tyrrell Museum opened. First work by um, Western scientists, we'll call them, in uh, the mid 1800s um, by people like uh, George Dawson started finding fossils. Um, then people like uh, Lawrence Lamb later on published the first major work on uh, fossils from, or invertebrate fossils from Alberta. And then into the dinosaur rush era with people like uh, Barnum Brown, the Sternbergs, and, uh, and their contemporaries. And there were a number of institutions and agencies that were doing paleontological work or had paleontological programs at the time the museum opened. Um, some of these have since uh, are no longer involved, like at one time, actually petroleum companies in Calgary had palynologists working for them. So there was, there was quite, a, quite a number of, uh, there was quite a lot of activity going on. The University of Alberta was the first one to actually, the first provincial institution to start collecting and, and uh, housing fossils in the province. Uh, when John Allen was hired in 1912 as the, uh, the first uh, professor of geology at the university. And uh, this fellow, Richard Fox, who uh, started in the mid-1960s at the University of Alberta, a vertebrate paleontologist, he has a strong connection here because 
Several of us were uh, graduate students of his and others took uh, paleontology classes from him. And here he is in the, uh, the old paleontology museum at the University of Alberta. And these are some of the, uh, the uh, original fossils and models that uh, Sternbergs and, and uh, Gilmore uh, collected for the museum. So the museum arrived kind of late on the scene, which is fine, because there's still lots of fossils to, uh, to work on. Um, I threw together this timeline in about an hour, and I didn't consult anyone. It was a great project. <laughs> uh, so I'm just using this to illustrate some of the events to uh, help us calibrate. 1980-ish, um, the, uh, the announcement. 80 to 85, the, the building is, the museum is planned, it's built. Um, the name Tyrrell Museum of Paleontology was uh, was coined in uh, 1981 by the founding director, Dr. Uh, Dr. Baird. And there was a heck of a lot of field work that went on during that time too. Um, a lot of effort to go out, find exhibit worthy specimens, dinosaurs, other things in Alberta. Um, so fanning out across the province to collect a lot of material. And that tradition of field work uh, continues to this day. Official opening, 85. Then for the rest of the decade, there was a lot of stuff going on. This uh, first major international uh, project, the China Canada Dinosaur Project, um, took museum researchers and technicians to China, brought Chinese contemporaries here to do work. And the museum has continued on with those sorts of big international or modest international uh, projects in some cases. Uh, museum hosted its first international scientific conference here great way to bring the international paleontological crowd to, to the museum to see it. Field station opened. Devil's Coulee, the dinosaur eggs and babies locality was discovered. Royal designation in 90. Um, the next decade, things like the Alberta source bone bed relocated. Uh, this day digs program started in the Drumheller area for uh, paid participants to come and uh, help dig up uh, duckbill dinosaur bone beds. And there's also, there's also the option for people to pay to watch those other people dig. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, this collection of a giant ichthyosaur in, uh, in British Columbia, which was a huge undertaking. And that, uh, that specimen is currently in our exhibit hall. Uh, the Learning Center edition in 2005, that was the first uh, so far only major addition to the facility. And then there was a, there was a bit of a turnover in the curatorial group with uh, Phil Curry and Paul Johnson leaving and some of us younger ones coming in. And that brings us up to the 30th anniversary. So the, uh, the founding group of curators, and this was a great opportunity to show some fantastic photos of my colleagues. Um, this was the initial group at a, by about 1983. So these fellows were, were brought in to uh, help design the museum, uh, collect or otherwise acquire specimens, and uh, did a heck of a lot, of, a lot of work. Probably helped that most of them were fairly young and energetic at the time. Uh, most of them were recent graduates. And by uh, the time the museum opened, there had already been some, some staff uh, turnover. Malcolm Heaton had died. Uh, Iggy Fay had left for health, re health reasons. They were replaced by Dave and uh, Paul, our invertebrate paleontologist. And then through to the, uh, the early uh, 2000s, this was the lineup. Um, Emmeline Coster was here as, a direct, as the director for a few years. She was a sedimentologist. And uh, Betsy Nichols, who had done her PhD work at the University of, of Calgary. Uh, was here working on uh, marine reptiles. And then the final turnover in the, in the mid-2000s mid with, uh, with some people leaving for other job opportunities, some additional deaths. Um, so we've still got the original three fellows and us newer ones. And this is another great example of my happy, <laughs> smiling face.
Now, I, I'm actually pretty proud of this one because uh, I was uh, coached by a Russian colleague on how to look Russian. <laughs> and uh, I got to say, it came pretty natural to me. All righty. So there's been, there's, in 30 years, there's been quite a change over in, uh, in staff. And, uh, you know, we expect within the next little while, there'll be some additional <laughs> changeover in staff. No hint. Um, at this point, I, I want to uh, <laughs> I want to point out that that this number of researchers, this sixish number, seems to be uh, a pretty good, pretty good, uh, pretty good number. Um, it's a small enough group that we all know each other. We we can uh, easily uh, talk talk amongst ourselves. There's a diversity of research interests mostly complementary, some overlapping. So it seems to be a good critical mass. And something I neglected to mention earlier on was that, uh, well, why don't we just go back, see if this works. Yeah, here we go. Okay. With only a few exceptions, the people on this, this slide came to the museum working on groups or intervals of time quite different than what they ended up working at the museum. So unlike today where we see job ads are very specific, targeted to must work on this kind of critter from this interval, um, these people came in and they developed their own, their own research uh, programs and interests based on what was available to them in the field, in the collections, and, uh, and so forth. So I think that's kind of a, a neat little historical aside. There is also another group here that does research. We have, over the years, had a number of postdoctoral fellows, some coming with their own external funding, some um, um, coming here because the museum provides funding. So just in recent years, uh, Tatuya Kanishi is here working on marine reptiles. He's currently at the University of Brandon. Uh, Mike Newbury is here for a number of years. Um, working on uh, fossil fish. Corey, still here, working on uh, some KT boundary projects. And uh, Caleb has just recently, well, I guess it's not that recent, it's over a year ago, joined us um, as the uh, current Betsy Nichols postdoctoral fellow. Um, some of the technicians have also done research, either on their own or in collaboration with others. The most obvious example being uh, Darren. Darren's also a walking encyclopedia of uh, history of paleontology in Alberta, and a uh, really great uh, person to talk to to, to get some, uh, some of the lesser known factoids about that sort of stuff. And I uh, guess if I want my key card to work tomorrow, I should mention that uh, <laughs> our director also uh, continues his hand in research on uh, fossil fish. This is a really exciting slide. I just want to talk a little bit about the fact that research is a core function at the museum. Um, and it was explicit in the original working name of the museum, which I didn't know until I started delving into the history, the Paleontological Museum and Research Institute. I think by and large, um, research has been pretty well supported at the museum. And uh, we've been given uh, uh, pretty much uh, free reign to work on the sorts of projects that uh, are of interest to us. That's I think it's worked out really well, and uh, it's helped generate a lot of publications, a lot of collaborations. The museum's mandate here is, and again, I didn't go through all the documents to find all the exciting mission statements and vision statements and so forth, but generally boils down to pre-quaternary geology and paleontology um, with reference to Alberta. And the reason there is that split here between the quaternary and everything else is because when the museum collections, Phil and some of the original technicians were spun off from what is now the Royal Alberta Museum, um, the quaternary folks stayed there along with the archaeologists. And so we took all the dinosaurs and the old clams and uh, came, down, came down here. Now, although the museum's mandate is uh, pre-quaternary down, for the most part, 
work here is focused on the uh, latter part of the late Cretaceous and early Paleocene, and that's because we have lots of fossiliferous rocks of that interval uh, in Alberta. So it makes sense that we would spend a lot of time working on, on those. Um, there has, however, also been some work done in the, uh, in the Jurassic, uh, down the Triassic, even down into the Cambrian. Paul Johnson, when he was here, started working on Burgess Shale as equivalent faunas in the uh, Cambrian of British Columbia. And uh, more recently, with the arrival of uh, Craig Scott, a decade ago now, um, there's been a lot more work done in the Paleocene targeting the, uh, the interval of time here that is also very well represented in the Albertan rock record and contains uh, evidence of, uh, or contains a lot of mammals during that time when they were radiating after the extinction of the dinosaurs. Field work, or field work, collections-based research, um, our research projects may be sort of one-offs or they may be part of a longer-term plan. Some of them are planned um, projects, others are opportunistic. We discover a new specimen, someone contacts us, say, hey, I found this stuff, um, do you want to work together on that? And I also want to emphasize that research is rarely an individual undertaking, although some of our papers just have our name, single researcher's name on them, there's often a lot of other people involved in it. Uh, a lot of the research we do is collaborative, uh, both within the museum here and with external colleagues. Um, a lot of colleagues at the University of Calgary, the Geological Survey of the University of Alberta, and uh, elsewhere in the country and internationally. Uh, we also have a number of external researchers uh, come to the museum to study tyrol specimens. Uh, for example, we, have, we actually have a really fantastic collection of amber arthropods and even some uh, feathers from the late Cretaceous of Alberta. Uh, we don't have anyone here who works on them, but uh, um, others such as Ryan, who's now at the, the Royal Saskatchewan Museum do. And of course, uh, we definitely need access to properties to go and look for fossils, collect fossils. So I think it's important to acknowledge that the landowners have been really generous with allowing us that. Uh, land managers like at uh, parks, mine operators, general public reporting discoveries. Um, and particularly in the last few years, uh, industry, uh, people building roads, digging trenches for sewers, so forth uh, have been when they see fossils that actually have been contacting us and we go out and, and try and collect them as quickly as possible. And sometimes they can help out with the real big equipment. And the paleo consultants, so ahead of projects like building roads and so forth. Um, paleontologists who work for consulting companies will go out and check the ground and we've gotten some really good, uh, good leads on localities and, and specimens from them. And here in house, we've got a whole group of people that su help support what we do. Uh, resource management group looks after permits. They're often our first point of contact with, uh, with industry. Uh, the preparation staff, and I love putting them in the cage and closing the door to take this photo. Uh, and they do a lot, of, a lot of the field work, preparation type work. Um, and in this photo, the group here, it's not our entire staff, uh, Darren calculated, they have over 150 years of experience. The people in collections, they're molding and casting, they make replicas for us, uh, scientific illustrator, and the Tyrrell Museum Cooperating Society that helps fund uh, research, funds this speaker series, helps bring in visiting researchers. This is not the norm at most institutions. We're pretty darn lucky to have all this support in-house. Um, a lot of places, they don't have a preparator. You have, you want something prepared, you have to contract someone to, uh, to do that for you, and you have to look after your own collections and so forth. So that's a really great that we have this support here and allows us to go off and, and really focus on research end of things. And, uh, I thought I'd talk about it. what I see as a few research themes. Um, looking back over the 30 years, 
uh, geology and chronology work, uh, discovery, study of fossil localities, and then sort of a classical, descriptive, and systematic paleontology. Now this is, I'm a little bit leery of doing this because I'm gonna be talking about a lot of other people's work. And I'm gonna do it in broad brush strokes, and if I don't mention particular projects that you feel real passionately about, sorry. <laughs> but it's my talk. <laughs> okay, so geology and chronology. And this, this is mostly what Dave Eberth has been involved in, Dennis Brayman has been involved in quite a bit, and uh, Francois has also been uh, uh, involved in it more recently. So as I mentioned, a lot of the work that has historically been done um, at the museum has been looking at the late Cretaceous of Alberta, particularly uh, these two units, the Belly River Group, which is uh, mid to late Campanian in age, and the Horseshoe Canyon Formation, which is uh, late Campanian to sort of mid Mistrophian in age. And those are the rocks that crop out along the, uh, the valley walls here. Um, so the Belly River Group, BRGP, this is where it's exposed in outcrop, and then the Horseshoe Canyon Formation and some equivalent uh, rocks in the Wapiti Formation there. Um, so the geological work can be done both from outcrops and drill cores. And Alberta is a really great place, at least, to, to work on this sort of, uh, these sorts of rocks, because there's lots of exposures, there's lots of three-dimensional exposures, and we have uh, pretty good access to a lot of those. And that, again, that's not the case in a lot of, lot of places. I've been in, uh, last summer, Dennis and I were down in Montana, and we had to be really careful that you didn't step onto some private landowner's land who didn't want any of those darn paleontologists on their land. Um, other places where your only exposures are along um, cliff faces, along, along uh, seashores, and those rocks could be obliterated in the next, uh, in the next uh, storm. So you never know from day to day if your locality is going to be there anymore. And the chronological work, which is trying to calibrate or determine the, the absolute or the relative ages, is done through uh, radiometric dating, uh, magnetostratigraphic work, and palynological work. Uh, Dave has been involved quite a bit in radiometric dating with colleagues down in Berkeley. Uh, Dennis, along with uh, colleagues like Art Sweet, done a lot of uh, palynological work, artists of the Geological Survey of Canada. And magnetostratigraphic work was uh, being done by um, um, Professor Lebecmo, who's uh, recently died. He was at the University of Alberta, Jack Lebecmo, uh, working with, with Dennis on, on that. Um, so these are the sorts of critters that, uh, they're not critters, they're palynomorphs that Dennis works on, pollen. Fossilized pollen preserves really well, and because there's so many different kinds of them, and some of them have short durations in the geological uh, record, you can produce these exciting diagrams like this, these range diagrams, and here's the KT boundary for the uh, mass extinction of dinosaurs uh, here, and you can use, uh, so something like this, because it has a really short time range, would be really great for helping you uh, determine if the rocks, the rocks you're looking at uh, fall within that, that, that interval. Uh, Belly River Group, these are slides that uh, are tillage from Dave. So Dave's done a lot of work looking in uh, these areas here at, uh, at Rock. A lot of work has been done in Dinosaur Provincial Park because there's great exposures there. Dinosaur Provincial Park is still one of the best places in the world for finding well-preserved, articulated dinosaur skeletons. It's basically the happy hunting ground of uh, this part of the world for that. And as a result of the, the work Dave did, a lot of it was in the mid 80s up into the, the mid 90s. He's, uh, he's been able to refine the, uh, the, the stratigraphy, the different units that are recognized, uh, define them fairly well, um, make some inferences about the sorts of depositional environments that, that uh, form those. Um, getting some radiometric dates to help provide some absolute ages and so forth. And 
That information can be used by us. It can also be used by others to build on. For example, this is some work that uh, Jordan Mallon at the Canadian Museum, now at the Canadian Muse Museum of Nature did, using some of Dave's information, information from our collections uh, records and uh, from other places to look at uh, time ranges of dinosaurs within the dinosaur uh, park formation of the Belly River Group. In the Edmonton Group, similar work has been done. That's been more recent-ish work that they've, that they've been doing. Um, so again, recognizing a number of uh, subdivisions of the Horseshoe Canyon formation, the different depositional conditions, uh, climate conditions that these are deposited under. Um, the whole uh, Edmonton Group, it actually is late Cretaceous and then ex extends into the, uh, the early Paleogene. So it includes the Cretaceous uh, tertiary boundary here, uh, boundary claystone here. There's several localities in, uh, in this part of Alberta that, that preserve that. And Dennis, Dave have done uh, uh, some work on that and helped contribute to our understanding of what was happening leading up to at and uh, immediately after that, that boundary, which was one of the big five uh, mass extinctions in the history of life on Earth. So it's kind of nice to have that basically in our own backyard. And taking all that work that they've done in the Edmonton group, this is a nice, uh, nice chart summarizing the, uh, the subdivisions they've been able to recognize, um, infer or inferences about climate changes or the conditions deposited, and then the, uh, the distributions of, of uh, major dinosaur groups. So this work that the Dave, Dennis, others have been doing on looking at the patches of rocks provides a really great framework for when those of us who are more interested in the fossils and the taxa, uh, because it allows to place those fossils and those taxa into stratigraphic uh, and temporal uh, context. And also um, be able to say something about the, the, the paleo environment that these, these animals lived in. So that's been a major, in my opinion, a fairly major contribution. And their work has not just been limited to Alberta. They've done a lot of work um, elsewhere as well. It's been actually kind of humbling to start digging through the literature and see just how many pies Dave has had his hands in, in a good way. Um, doing a lot of work with, <laughs> with various uh, uh, colleagues all over the world. Uh, the second major theme is um, sort of awkwardly titled Discovery, Excavation, and Study of Fossil Localities. <laughs> so this, uh, this includes uh, previously known localities, uh, localities that have been lost and subsequently re rediscovered. Uh, a really good example of that is the Albertosaurus bone bed in, uh, up in uh, Dry Island, which was a locality that was found and worked in uh, the early part of the previous century. There was material sitting in collections at the American Museum of Natural History, but nobody subsequently knew where it was. Um, and with a bit of detective work, Phil and others um, were able to uh, relocate it um, and reopen that quarry and have collected uh, quite a bit of material from it. Um, there's also, of course, many new localities found by Tyrrell staff every summer when we're out prospecting um, and by others other colleagues, uh, members of the public find objects or fossils routinely, consultants and so forth. Um, and there's a, a big emphasis on uh, with these localities, new ones and the rediscovered ones, to try and na really nail down their geographic and stratigraphic positions so that uh, we can, we can uh, and that's really helpful with know, particularly important dinosaur uh, fossils, to be able to know exactly where it came from rather than, eh, it was in the dinosaur provincial park area. Well, that, that's a pretty big area and it represents a fairly good chunk of time. So it's nice to be able to say it's from there. Um, so that's the discovery part of it and some of the study, excavation, obviously the old, the old fossils. Uh, the fossils in themselves are interesting and informative, but they have a lot more value if we know where they came from and 
the rocks can tell us a lot about the, the age and deposition, uh, the taphonomy, other plants and animals live with them, uh, paleo environment, paleo ecosystem, and a lot of, a lot of uh, researchers here have been involved in doing that. And of course, fossils may be found in place, or they're more useful, uh, out of place too. They may be in scree slopes where they've fallen down. We've uh, got a few specimens that have been picked up out of riverbeds, and there's even a few that have come out of building rocks, someone's retaining wall, uh, riprap. Um, a few years ago, there was a block came in because someone had been using it as a landscape ball block and realized, oh, there were some turtle bits in there. So they can be found almost anywhere. They can turn up in quite surprising places. Now, another big area of uh, work that uh, people here have been involved in, especially Dave, is looking at uh, the taphonomy. So the, the how fossils are, uh, how an when animals die, how the carcasses are, whether they're buried quickly, whether they're, they're, uh, they fall apart, and so forth. Uh, so Dave's done a lot of work on that, and he has this useful chart here for uh, the taphonomic modes that he's identified in Dinosaur Park. And he quite rightly pointed out to me when I was talking to him about it that this works really good in Dinosaur Provincial Park and similar places. But like any organizational or classification scheme, it maybe doesn't work everywhere. So I'm going to start by talking about some of these uh, examples with the asterisks, and then I'll move into a couple other relevant ones in Alberta. Um, articulated specimens, so nearly complete skeletons where the bones are all in their natural position or nearly so. Spectacular specimens, they yield a, a lot of information about, uh, about the organisms. Uh, we have a couple of these DEFCOs uh, theropods, both in the gallery. Uh, this specimen had uh, evidence of uh, feathers attaching along its, uh, along its legs and preserved some of the, uh, the, the keratinous beak, like a bird beak, on it. Uh, the recent article I showed early on, this feathered ornithomimid collected from uh, the valley here, first indication of feathers in this particular clade of dinosaurs. Uh, so that was very exciting, and it shows that feathers were even more widespread among theropods than we had uh, previously suspected. You will have seen this picture last week, our famous Mylodaphis skeleton. And uh, a lot of uh, marine reptiles, really nice preserved specimens, including ones with, uh, with putative gut content in them. Most of the specimens that we we collect and we have in our collections are not that complete. Um, here are some examples of some, some local fossils. There's uh, articulated uh, ones that are not quite as complete. Uh, this is part of a mammal skull that Kim Showalter found a few, well, a number of years ago. A um, alligator, early alligator skull that Jim McCabe uh, found. And then associated specimens where the, the remains of one individual but the bones have been kind of floated apart. Um, this is a Trocia raptor. This uh, was also found in the uh, a small, small theropod. Another um, sort of fossil deposit that we have a lot of in Alberta, and there's been a lot of work done at the museum, is uh, macro fossil bone beds. So these are accumulations of larger size uh, bones from multiple uh, individuals. And work, work on these at the, uni uh, at the museum started even before the museum opened. There's a lot of work done on this in the, uh, in the 19, uh, 1980s and, and uh, first part of the 1990s in Dinosaur Provincial Park. And uh, some of that work has, has started, uh, started again in more earnest with uh, some of the work that Caleb's doing in Dinosaur Provincial Park now. Alberta has over, according to Dave, over 200 dinosaur bone beds. So it's almost an embarrassment of riches. The museum has been involved in uh, at least looking at most of those and uh, extensively working some of them. The, uh, the Danek bone bed in, uh, in Edmonton was one that the museum worked for a couple seasons in the 1980s. Um, since Phil, has, Phil Curry has gone to the University of Alberta, it's become um, uh, basically his field school site. So they go out every year and they work it. Very convenient, right within the, the city limits. 
Uh, the Pipestone Creek bone bed that Darren has spent many summers at up in the Grand, the Grand Prairie area. So most of, these, uh, most of these bone beds are ceratopsid bone beds, uh, horned dinosaurs, uh, the Danek bone bed, and there are some bone beds in the Drumheller area, are hadrosaur, duckbill dinosaurs, and the Albertosaurus bone bed that I showed a photo of earlier, that's um, a theropod bone bed. And bone beds can tell us a fair amount of information. Um, because they're preserving bones of multiple individuals, um, they're a good opportunity to uh, look at things like individual variation, growth, sexual dimorphism, may be able to make some inferences about uh, behavior, hurting, scavenging, if you've got tooth marks on bones, uh, disease, see uh, arthritis, healed uh, fractures, things like that. Um, and how they are formed, because not all bone beds were formed the same way. And I like to show this slide because it's a good example of how research that's done at the museum feeds back into uh, gallery work. This is a uh, uh, d uh, diorama that was uh, opened a few, uh, I guess more than a few years ago, at the museum, um, showing one scenario of what the uh, Albertosaurus bone bed might how it might, uh, what it, how it might have formed, and what it, what it indicates. Uh, another sort of bone bed, the one, ones that I'm actually more interested in, are uh, uh, microfossil bone beds. These are accumulations of small, uh, isolated bones, teeth, and scales from different sized animals, uh, and multiple individuals of them. And these are. We've got bits of, bits of shell here on the surface, at least some teeth and so forth. Um, so you spend a lot of time walking around, looking at the ground, uh, looking for these. And this has been a big area of research by uh, Don Brinkman, who started working on this even before the museum opened. And uh, Don, and along with uh, uh, Dave, have identified dozens of bone be microfossil bone beds through the, late Cretace the upper part of the late Cretaceous in, uh, in Alberta. I've uh, been able to place in the stratigraphic sequence and have made a lot of, um, been a lot of material collected. And that's, uh, you know, pretty exhausting work. <laughs> and a fellow needs a nap once in a while. Um, so Don's main interest has been uh, more in the, uh, the faunal diversities and community structure and so forth, microfossil uh, bone beds. Um, right, I should talk about how they're collected. So, uh, these uh, accumulations of uh, microfossils are, you need to uh, dig them out and uh, uh, sack all this rock. Uh, this is some work I uh, was dabbling in down in the, the Milk River Formation, and some of Phil Curry's students happened to be out that day, so I worked them like rented mules. <laughs> that was a good day. Um, and then the, the material is brought back, and it's uh, soaked and washed through fine mesh screen to get rid of all the, uh, or most of the rock and hopefully leave a residue of, of fossils behind. And then the, uh, the laborious um, effort of picking through all this, it looks like kitty litter, to uh, extract all the little, little bones and fossils. And the haul can be quite good. You can get uh, quite a lot of fossils from some of the best sites. They can be very well preserved and quite a diversity. Everything from uh, small amphibian uh, jaws uh, up to uh, pieces of larger animals as well. So microfossil bone beds are quite useful for providing a, uh, a pretty good picture of faunal diversity because they're sampling remains from different sized uh, individuals. They're the main source of information about small bodied animals. They're rarely preserved skeletons. So for someone like me who works on frogs and salamanders, they're, they're great. Uh, and there can be lots of specimens and sometimes uh, quite spectacularly preserved. And uh, I mentioned that uh, Don's uh, interest in microvertebrate localities is on community structures. Um, bone beds can sample uh, various communities. Sometimes there's a mix of them. Sometimes they're clearly one or the other. So what looks like just rubble can actually have a, a fair amount of uh, information uh, value to it. So a lot of work has been done on microvertebrate uh, localities as well. And then there's some other localities that 
uh, certainly deserves to be mentioned, the Devil's Truly Egg Nest locality. It was discovered in 87 and uh, got a lot of media exposure. Um, and it's an area that, that is now uh, province purchased, protected. Um, some of our, uh, Jen and our resource management group has been working to, uh, uh, with the local group down there to help develop some signs and so forth to uh, better protect and educate. Uh, well, protect the locality and educate the people who visit the locality. Uh, dinosaur egg nests and uh, nice drawing by Donna Sloan of uh, some of the, the really nice embryonic dinosaur uh, material that's come out of it. So this is an embryonic uh, duck-billed dinosaur. And, uh, and then in the Paleocene, a lot of the, the material that uh, we're collecting in terms of vertebrate material is uh, it's all hand quarried, it's small material, uh, mammals, uh, jaws, teeth, sometimes skulls, and so forth. And that's, uh, that's an area of, of extremely active field work by Craig, and uh, anticipate that, that uh, there'll be a lot more uh, really great fossils and discoveries coming out of that work. So as a result of all the field work that, uh, that we do collecting, we've amassed large collections in the museum from, uh, from the province and uh, some really great specimens. Um, quick snapshot of the research collections. Uh, we got a lot of stuff. A lot of it's from Alberta and a lot from Lake Cretaceous. Uh, threw this in for Dennis. Although the museum is often called that dinosaur museum, for holotype specimens, which are main bearing specimens, uh, a vanishingly small fraction of dinosaurs, more than half of them are actually palinomorphs, uh, many of which uh, Dennis has been involved in naming. Um, the specimens and the information about the specimens used a lot by museum researchers. We also get a lot of uh, visiting researchers coming as well, and uh, most of those are here for, uh, for dinosaur research. And the, uh, the third theme is uh, descriptive and systematic paleontology. And while I toyed with the idea of flogging my Alban or Patented amphibian work, I thought we wouldn't do that. So instead, I'm going to talk about uh, two examples, uh, two almost back-to-back -back papers that, that Phil Curry published in 2003. One was a descriptive paper on uh, where he was looking at um, all the, the, the well-preserved tyrannosaurid fossils that were available from Alberta, uh, which was 48 articulate and associated ones, uh, including 21 in the, in the Turo collection. And most of those 21s were, were collected as a result of uh, field programs that he was involved in or, or, uh, or overseeing. Um, the objectives of this particular study, uh, detailed bone-by-bone -bone descriptions, it's not surprising when you get into literature to discover, oh yeah, we've known about this critter for decades, but no one's actually done a really detailed uh, description. And so that sort of work is really important. And if it can be uh, complemented by really good photographs or drawings, that's a huge benefit. And as a result of that work, uh, Phil determined that there were these five species that could be represented or recognized, different formations and the, the time interval that they, uh, they came from. And then in a subsequent paper in the same journal, he and some colleagues uh, did a uh, cladistic analysis. They were looking at relationships among tyrannosaurids and uh, based solely on uh, skull characteristics. And you see these really exciting cladograms quite often in, it, in our papers, simply a way of examining or inferring relationships among, among groups. And in Phil's study, he recognized there were these two uh, subclades of tyrannosaurids um, from, uh, this is an exclusively uh, North American one. This one is North American and includes an Asian one. And unlike uh, a colleague in a previous publication, he, uh, he found there was no no basis for assuming that this North American and this Chinese Mongolian uh, Tyrannosaurid were closely related. Now this work, um, this sort of work is, is useful because it, it provides a framework for relationships and you can start asking questions about, well, if we've got uh, this clade 
here with an Asian and mostly North American Tyrannosaurids, how did that happen? Did the group start in Asia and move to North America or vice versa? This work was done in 2003. Quite frankly, I haven't really kept up on the Tyrannosaurid literature, but there's been a lot of additional discoveries, um, new taxa recognized, and so this pattern of relationships uh, will have been examined, probably challenged and changed in a lot of subsequent papers. And that's fine. That's how our science progresses. I would never bet the ranch on anyone's cladistic analysis, including my own. And I want to touch briefly on some of the other uh, activities that the research program has been involved in. There's been a number of uh, major externally funded uh, uh, field projects outside of Alberta, beginning with the uh, Sino-Canadian Dinosaur Project in the 80s and extending all the way through to the present. And you can tell these are important projects because there's the pamphlet and the t-shirt. Yeah. Uh, the benefits of these are, well, lots of scientific papers, lots of new information come out. Um, it's also, I think, really important for providing a regional and a global context for better interpreting the Albertan record. Uh, as Phil once said to me, sometimes to understand what's in your own backyard, you have to get out of your own backyard. And so that sort of, uh, that sort of knowledge and appreciation has been really useful. Um, it's also been uh, advantageous for uh, developing uh, new collaborations. Every project we undertake seems to open the door to additional opportunities. And there were two major exhibits that uh, came out as a result of this, this international traveling exhibit. And then there was uh, uh, an exhibit about the, the work done in Argentina that was here at the, at the museum in the early 2000s. And the Tyrol has also ho hosted a number of scientific uh, conferences. Um, early on, three consecutive years, uh, they hosted three major conferences. And uh, I don't know if that was really planned, but I think it was a really great way in the pre-internet era to bring international colleagues to the museum to see the facility, to see fossils, visit outcrops, localities, and connect with, uh, with paleontologists here. And these, these sorts of symposia are really great for making those sorts of connections. I've certainly made a lot of really valuable uh, connections with people I work with quite a bit as a result of going to these sorts of conferences. And there's been a number of uh, uh, publications, um, edited collections of, of papers and books that have, uh, have been put out. I'd like to point out that uh, last year this didn't make enough for me to even have to pay taxes on. So if people want to buy it, that would be great. I'd like to get that bass boat one day. And I'd like to end with this uh, nice logo that Donna Sloan drew, and she's, she's revamped it uh, several times. She initially did it for the SBC meetings that were here in the, uh, the mid-'80s, and she's updated it several times. Um, museum's done quite a bit. Uh, there's still certainly lots to do. Um, it's a truism that we've barely scratched the surface. There's, there's still lots of great rock out there, lots of fossils that uh, remain to be remain to be found, and new ways of looking at those and interpreting them. So happy 30th to us. And I wanted to add this slide. I just put it in this morning. Um, Vladimir Kerb, who uh, painted many of the murals in the museum, uh, died on the weekend. Uh, I never met Vladimir, but uh, when I first visited the museum in, I think, 1986 or fall of 85, I came out with some some university friends, uh, was really struck by the, uh, the murals that he painted, and they've become quite, uh, quite iconic. So in the context of a 30-year retrospective, I thought it was appropriate to uh, throw in a few examples of uh, his work. Um, the usual thanks to people, especially. I'm just going to do a blanket thanks to everyone at the museum because I don't want to miss anyone. Everyone's been really good. Uh, a few of my colleagues have uh, helped out as well. And, uh, of course, the home contingent, uh, because it seems like every project I work on, late in the game, my wife becomes a manuscript widow, because I, uh, oh, 
lock myself away in my office or stay late. And there's my one amphibian photo picture. 